Hello everyone, I'm Robin Pearson and I'm here to show you what remains of the Cora Church in Istanbul. This is the building famous for its amazing collection of mosaics and frescoes. According to most scholars, the Church of Christ in Cora translates as the Church of Christ in the countryside. This could mean that a church was founded on this spot before the Theodosian walls were built, when it would literally have been in the countryside. But since the church lies only 150 metres from the walls, and this part of Constantinople was largely farmland, it could have been founded after the walls went up. Byzantine churches tended to be rebuilt on the same spot if they were knocked down by an earthquake, and that is probably the case with the Cora Church. Pieces from earlier structures have been found, but the present building dates back to the late 11th century. The restoration was funded by various members of the Emperor Alexius Komnenos' family, who became patrons of the church and the monastery that it was a part of. The building required further restoration in the early 14th century, when Theodore Metochites became its patron. Metochites was a high government official and polymath who lavished great sums on the church. Metochites essentially became prime minister during this period, giving him the wealth and connections to decorate the building to the highest standards of the day. Being so close to the land walls, the Cora Church became a natural space to house the famous icon of the Virgin Mary, which the Byzantines believed would help protect them from enemy attack. Sadly for them, nothing could stop the Ottomans on the 29th of May 1453. The Cora Church was one of the first sites to be looted, and the famous icon was hacked to pieces. Fifty years later, the building was converted into a mosque, and became known as Karya Jami, more or less a direct translation of Cora, so the countryside mosque. Thanks to Cora's small size and its location, far from the centres of power, its mosaics and frescoes were largely ignored by its new owners. It wasn't until the 17th or 18th century that plaster was applied to most of its surfaces, covering up, but not destroying, the art underneath. In 1945, the building was turned into a museum, opening up the possibility of restoring some of its former glory. Starting in 1947 and continuing throughout the 1950s, the Byzantine Institute of America restored the building. This included exposing and cleaning the Byzantine decoration. The building is currently undergoing restoration and in 2020 was converted back into a mosque. Hopefully, it will open again for visitors at some point. The building which Theodore Metochites inherited was a fairly typical small monastic church. It was he who added this outer narthex and this funerary chapel, or paraclesion. This was to be Metochites' legacy. He refounded the entire monastic complex, adding a new hospital, public kitchen, and library. Metochites himself was to be recognized in the new artwork and buried in the new chapel. There are a number of interesting architectural and sculptural features which can be seen in the Cora Church, but understandably our focus will be on its art. I can't overstate what a rare find the Cora decoration is. With Byzantium conquered by a Muslim power, its churches slowly disappeared over time, and those that remained in Christian hands had to be renovated and updated. In Constantinople itself, plenty of ex-churches survive, but their art has been lost, shaken away by earthquakes or redecoration. A few pieces do survive here and there, but no full decorative cycle remains except at Cora. Thanks to a combination of luck, obscurity, and the tolerance of its new owners, the art survived, and we can now step through its doors and be transported to another world.
From the mid-9th century, all Byzantine churches took on this distinctive look, their internal walls covered in mosaic and fresco, depicting Jesus and Mary, angels and saints, and a host of biblical scenes. These images welcome the believer away from the ordinary world and into the kingdom of heaven. For people who were not saturated in images the way we are, these pictures had a tremendous impact, bringing stories and sermons to life and providing a conduit through which the believer could feel an intimate connection to the divine. Each church varied in the images which they chose to depict, though there was a standard pattern and hierarchy which was always observed. Generally, the higher you look, the more likely you are to see Jesus and Mary, while lower down, saints and bishops are figuratively and literally closer to the believer. The artists Theodore Metocites hired did not slap scenes on the walls at random. They planned the program carefully to reflect the church's dedication, the function of each space, and the need to honour their patron. We'll start in the nave, or naos, of the church itself. It was closed when I visited, so I don't have any footage. As you can see, this is actually the least decorated part of the building. Much of the original art has been lost. But these two panels, depicting Jesus on the left and Mary with baby on the right, are key to the theme of the building's art. Though this is the Church of Christ in Cora, the wider monastery was dedicated to Mary. So the decoration of the church reflects this dual patronage. The name Cora itself was also repurposed. In addition to countryside, you could translate it as simply country, or land, or place. On each mosaic is an inscription. Jesus is probably described here as dwelling place, Cora, of the living, while Mary is described as dwelling place of the uncontainable. Here, the potential wider meaning of Cora is explored to give the foundation's name a mystical meaning. This shared patronage is reflected throughout the building. While the nave is dedicated to Christ, the funerary chapel was built to honour Mary. Each receives an entire narthex worth of space dedicated to telling their life story. While two domes, which sit side by side, feature the ancestry of each. Through their respective lives, most of the Christian message is spelt out in beautiful imagery across the building. The story of the Virgin Mary's early life is depicted in mosaic high above the visitor. The story takes us back to before Mary was conceived, to the struggles of her parents, Joachim and Anne. Here, Joachim returns home to be told by his wife that she has had a miraculous conception and that they are to have a child. They are delighted and proud of their baby daughter Mary and grateful to God. So grateful that they give her to the temple in Jerusalem as an offering. Eventually, she is married off to Joseph, who was selected by the high priest thanks to a little divine intervention. If you've never heard this part of the story before, that's because it isn't in your standard Bible. It's from the apocryphal Gospel of James, one of those Gospels which church leaders eventually decided not to include in the New Testament. But stories about Mary's early life and her own immaculate conception were very popular in medieval Europe. A similar cycle can be seen in the Arena Chapel in Padua, which was decorated about a decade before Cora. We then move into more familiar territory, as Mary's story continues, as told in the canonical Gospels. Joseph is told in a dream about Mary's Immaculate Conception, they journey to Bethlehem because of the Roman census, and then find a safe place for Jesus to be born. The wise men come to visit the child, and so on. The story then moves on to the adult Jesus' ministry, again familiar from the Gospels. He turns water into wine. He is tempted by the devil in the wilderness. He feeds the 5,000. There are also many panels 
showing him healing the sick. Obviously, it would take a much longer video to discuss all the facets of these mosaics, but it's worth saying that they interact with the building surfaces in a way that the artist clearly planned out carefully in advance, which is a feature of Byzantine churches, as if the entire building has been transformed into one gigantic icon. The artist also chose the location of each panel carefully to draw parallels between the stories of mother and son. The birth of the Virgin in the inner narthex is in the exact same spot as the nativity scene in the outer narthex. The quality of the work is also very special. Many scenes have real depth, with structures and landscapes in the background, as well as conveying emotion and movement in each character. If you would like to be talked through the entire narrative cycle of Mary and Jesus' lives, then check out this video by the excellent Sheriff Yannon. The inner narthex has two domes either side of the main doors of the nave. Christ and the Virgin are at the centre of each. Jesus is surrounded by some of his famous ancestors. Here you can see Enos, Abel, Adam, Seth, and Noah. The figures continue on towards Jacob and his twelve sons. Meanwhile, Mary is flanked by kings of Israel, including David and Solomon. Here, the art is connecting the story of Jesus' life to the creation of the world itself. Jesus and Mary also share this bay, which dominates the inner narthex. This is a traditional image of the pair known as the diasis. As you may have noted, it is quite similar to the diasis in the gallery of the Hagia Sophia, which was created about 50 years before this. This could be deliberate imitation. Theodore Metochites seems to have been striving to produce a building of imperial quality. Case in point, just above the nave door, Metochites himself kneels, humbly offering the Cora Church to Christ. Again, this seems to deliberately echo the Hagia Sophia, which features an identical scene of an emperor kneeling. Metochites is wearing his finest robe and sports a high hat, or turban, giving us an indication of the finery of the contemporary Byzantine court. Back to the diocese for a moment, Metochites did honour past patrons of the building as well. Below Christ and Mary are these two figures. On the left, we have Isaac Komnenos, the Emperor Alexius's third son. He sponsored the rebuilding of the site a century before Metochites. While on the right, the inscription identifies this woman as Melanie, Lady of the Mongols. We believe she was an illegitimate daughter of the Emperor Michael VIII, who was married off to the Mongol Khan before returning to Constantinople. Presumably, she was the last major patron of the monastery before Metochites. Either side of the nave doors, by the way, are St. Peter and St. Paul in glittering mosaic. Taking a step back into the outer narthex, we see that Christ Pantocrator is the image that welcomed visitors to the church. The inscription around him echoes the play on the name Korah, identifying him as Jesus Christ, the dwelling place of the living. We can now walk to the far end of the outer narthex and take a look at the Paraclesion, or burial chapel. The Paraclesion was built by Metochites, strengthening his role as honoured patron of the monastery. He would be buried here, ensuring that future generations would pay him due deference and pray for his soul. In turn, Metochites honoured Mary, the true patron of the monastic complex. Her role in the salvation of mankind is emphasised throughout the decorative programme. In here, we see only frescoes rather than mosaics. As this is a burial chapel, the focus of the art is on death and resurrection, culminating in this 
amazing portrayal of the Last Judgment on the ceiling directly above us. In this conception of the end of time, all dead people come back to life to be judged by Christ. Some will go to heaven, others to hell. This particular scene seems to be inspired by another apocryphal gospel, that of Nicodemus. The question is, how do you show, visually, all of the dead being brought back to life? The answer? You have Jesus pulling Adam and Eve out of their graves. A beautifully simple and powerful image of salvation. Look below the victorious image of Christ and you will see the devil, bound and gagged, the keys to the gates of hell and his instruments of torment are scattered around him. But judgment is still to come. Here, Christ sits with his heavenly entourage of angels. But note Mary and John the Baptist either side of him, their hands stretched out, interceding on behalf of humanity. This is the deesis scene in miniature, the moment at which Christ is able to offer the salvation that he won for us on the cross. Where the standard deesis image is a close-up, we now zoom out to take in the whole scene. Beneath Christ, those who will be saved on the left wait nervously for judgment, while those who are damned to the right face down a fiery stream. The scene covers the roof and spills over onto the side walls, continuing the narrative in multiple directions. No other Byzantine church that we know of used its ceiling to present this scene in such vivid detail. The vital role of the Virgin as carrier of Christ is stressed through her position in the dome, where she and the baby Jesus are attended by twelve angels. Numerous other scenes decorate the high reaches of the building. There are too many to talk about here. Easier to spot further down are the saints and bishops who helped guide humanity towards the truth. Listeners of the History of Byzantium podcast may recognise St. George, St. Demetrius, and John Chrysostom, amongst many others. Also at eye level are the tombs or arcosolia which lined the chapel walls. Several aristocratic figures were laid to rest in here, and these inscriptions and paintings identify who they were. Metochites himself was most likely buried here, under the dome. According to historian Robert Austerhout, placing these tombs under the depiction of the Last Judgment is meant to remind us that Metochites too will one day be resurrected and judged. Cheekily, perhaps, his tomb is on the same side as those who Jesus chose to save. One video can't do justice to the masterpiece that the Cora Church most certainly is. And only when you see the whitewashed interiors of other former Byzantine churches do you realise how rare and special a find it is. Theodore Metochites wrote that he wanted to relate in mosaics and painting how the Lord himself became a mortal man on our behalf. He did more than that, taking the story all the way back to Adam through the miraculous birth of Mary and forward to the end of time when Christ's mission would finally be complete. He also said that he hoped the church would serve for him a glorious memory among posterity till the end of the world. We'll see about that, though thanks to the turbulent history of the city he left behind, he may have come closer to his goal than he ever imagined. If and when the Karia Jami opens again for visitors, you should make it a priority. Always check opening times and ticket prices online. It would also be natural to combine your visit with a walk along the Theodosian land walls. 
Ederne Capi, the Adrianople Gate, is just an eight-minute walk away, and nearby is a potential spot for climbing the walls. Though if you do, please be careful. If you'd like more detailed information about the Cora Church, then visit thebyzantinelegacy.com. It's a fantastic website providing breakdowns of the Byzantine buildings that can still be seen today, and there you'll find most of the still images and sketches used in these videos. 